our stories. A woman escapes conflict and finds refuge where she can mourn the violent deaths of her husband and children. But then she becomes a victim of sexual assault at the hands of those who are supposed to protect her. With no means to escape, she suffers in silence. A teenage girl, kidnapped and sold to a man to be his wife and slave, raped daily, she is forced to bear his children to build the next generation of terrorists. A little girl, raped for over seven years in her own home by her brother, her parents refuse to punish him or to protect her. When she goes public with what happened, she is called a liar, a disgrace to the family. She's cast out into the world, and she is alone. A happy young bride soon discovers the harsh and deviant nature of her husband. She leaves him and goes to the police. Her family threatens to kill her if she ever returns to her homeland. All of these stories are about women who are alive today, women from Syria, Nigeria, Iran, and the United States. All of these women had the courage to tell their stories and bring attention to an outrage that reaches every corner of the globe, including this corner, because one of those stories is mine. As far back as ancient history, women have been the victims of gender-based violence. And make no mistake, it is still true today. It is a crisis so extreme, so widespread, that the United Nations has declared this. It is more dangerous to be a woman fetching water, collecting firewood, than a male fighter on the front lines. That's right. War does not just mean two nations fighting against another on a battlefield. War is everywhere. It occurs in our daily lives, in our family relationships, in our neighborhoods, and in our homes. And no matter where the battlefield is, women are weapons of war. And today, it is time to disarm. I can pinpoint the exact moment this became my cause. In 2005, as a human rights lawyer, I was representing three young brothers from Honduras in asylum proceedings. One night, I was sitting in the office with their mother, Rosa, to prepare her to testify. She grew quiet, her smile faded, her hands clasped nervously in her lap. She slowly lifted her head, her eyes meeting mine, and said, I'm going to tell you something I've never told anyone. Rose's husband was a military police officer. He'd bring his fellow soldiers and officers home to rape her. The men viewed this as their right, their honor. One brave night, Rosa tried to escape. Her husband and his comrades shot at her. That night in my office, she pulled my hand in hers, and I felt the bullet pieces still in her leg. As tears rolled down her face, she slowly lifted the side of her shirt to reveal a scar in the shape of an iron. He branded me, she said, to remind me never to leave. Rosa would be one of only many women who sat in my office and drew on an amazing strength to tell their story. Human trafficking victims, rape victims. Having lived through sexual violence of my own, I wanted to be a voice to say to these women, I do understand. I've been there. You are safe now. And then fight to get them the freedom and safety and healing that they deserved. But I also knew the work went beyond representing one woman at a time. This is a global crisis, but solutions exist. And ending the crisis requires evolution of our thoughts and our actions in our daily lives. But to do it, we have to all understand the nature and depth of the problem. Rwanda, 250,000 women raped in a three-month time period during the 1994 genocide. Democratic Republic of Congo, in 2011, 48 women were raped every hour. That's almost one per minute. America, every two minutes, a person is sexually assaulted. England, 85,000 women are raped every year, but only 15% report it to the police. France, every 40 minutes, a rape is reported. That is horrific enough on its own. Even worse, Nine out of 10 rapes in France are not reported at all. As terrible as these facts are, 
Hope remains. For the last 75 years, the world has slowly progressed towards addressing this crisis. The Nuremberg Tribunal, following World War II, was the first to address sexual violence against women. But it then took 40 years for rape to be defined as a crime against humanity, and another eight years after that for the first conviction. Society simply did not deem sexual violence to be a priority or a crime that needed punishment. But finally, in 2008, the United Nations Security Council unanimously voted for a resolution that described rape as a threat to international security. Ten years later, significant atrocities remain. Modern wars are increasingly characterized by the use of rape to terrorize populations and destroy communities. The first order of business is usually to deprive women of access to education and health services restricting their participation in economic and political life. In other conflicts, women are deliberately infected with sexually transmitted diseases to render them unable to bear children or as a biological weapon to infect others. This is ethnic cleansing. Daesh continues to unleash violence that disproportionately targets women. Girls as young as 13, lured by terrorist recruiters, they become brides of the caliphate, and are forced to bear children to breed a new generation of terrorists. 3,000 Yazidi women and girls from Iraq, enslaved, sexually abused, and traded like chattel in the human trafficking underworld to fund terrorist attacks. But the problem goes far beyond using women as a means to fund war. Boko Haram has turned women into actual weapons by deploying young innocent girls as suicide bombers. The estimates are that the number of girls used in suicide bombing attacks per year has skyrocketed from four to 44. UNICEF says three out of four child bombers are girls. But the reason many women and girls give to become suicide bombers is not what you might think. Picture a refugee camp in Cameroon. Crowded tents, malnourished bodies, hopelessness. As one young woman tells it, the question was always the same. So too is the answer. The men would ask, who wants to be a suicide bomber? And the girls would shout, me, me, me. But it was not because these young girls had embraced violent jihad or been brainwashed by their captors. Hundreds of girls kidnapped by Boko Haram and forced to marry its fighters. They faced death unless they succumbed to this fate. Many are teenagers some not even 10 years old. The trauma from the sexual abuse becomes too much for them to bear. They want an escape, and that escape is death. As a result, we have the greatest and most tragic irony. The most vulnerable population in Nigeria is now becoming the most feared. Girls are ostracized by their communities, some out of fear that they've become a terrorist, Others simply because of archaic beliefs that the girl is no longer clean or fit to be a part of society. But these views are not unique to conflict, nor does sexual violence against women occur only in Syria, Iraq, or Nigeria. It is happening in your house next door, in the nightclubs you drive past, in the schools and churches your children attend daily. Any of these victims could be your wife or your daughter, your sister or your best friend. Sexual violence has historically been culturally accepted, and that is still true today. Men are given a slap on the wrist under the idea of boys will be boys. Murder receives a life sentence. A rapist in America gets a few months in jail, while the woman he raped must spend the rest of her life partially dead inside. Sadly, the idea remains that rape is just not that big of a deal. Women are blamed for sexual assaults because of the clothing they wore or because they consumed alcohol. Or they're simply not believed and shamed on national television for even making an accusation. Worst of all is the belief that sexual assault is something minor, something relatively easy for a person to recover from. As a woman and as a survivor, I strongly disagree. When people talk about the worst thing that can happen to you, Death is what usually comes to mind, but not for a rape victim. Most of those who undergo sexual abuse would rather 
be killed. And so the idea that even one woman suffers rape or violence is enough to say, end this. It is enough to say, it is time to disarm. As long as our world considers sex crimes to be minor offenses during times of peace, widespread rape will never be deemed a high crime during war, when the rules of human interaction are turned upside down. The use of women as weapons will never change as long as violent aggression against women is tolerated in everyday life. But we don't have to accept a world where women are used as weapons. Women can be our peacemakers, our leaders, our guardians. Advancing women's rights and empowerment is vital to this endeavor. We need awareness, justice, and reforms in policy and foreign diplomacy. But we cannot wait for governments to act. Laws are not the only answer. We must stop the trend of shaming women and excusing men's behavior. Remove the stigma that survivors of sexual violence face. Demand legitimacy from our governments and our courts so that women and children feel safe coming forward. But we also have to create new families and support systems for survivors to give them the love and compassion needed to help them heal. Women with strength, knowledge and resources can set an example for their children and raise their sons to break from the norm. But men have to set an example through your actions and through your words. So what can you do? Can one person affect change? Absolutely, yes. I've seen it with my own eyes. People like Hadia, a Syrian refugee who rose from her own trauma and now helps female refugees who have been raped. And as for you, volunteer at a local shelter and open your life to women in need. Educate your children and set an example. Donate to an organization providing survivor services. And all of you can ask your governments to promote women's equality. Today, I challenge all of you to post on social media about a statistic you heard today that shocked you. Because one out of three women worldwide will experience sexual violence in her lifetime. Join us, support us, and send a message to the world that the next generation will not bear the pain of this statistic. I would not be standing before you today without the help and love of all those who believed in me when I came forward. You can help the girls of today become the guardians of tomorrow. In their name, and in the name of all girls who live in danger, it is time to tell the world women are not weapons of war. It is time to disarm. Thank you.